I have no other way uh, to think of this than to think of this as a story about madness. Because uh, it's not normal. I mean, it's not even normal according to the way in which uh, most revelation takes place. It seems that the history of revelation is full of a, well, a certain kind of sweetness. I guess because of my own natural skepticism, it has been easy for me for all of these years not to tell the story of my encounter, because it is mad. And there's no proof. That's the thing that's so interesting about telling stories. It's just a story. And I think it's better that you take it that way. In a sense, it has nothing to do with human design. Human design stands on its own feet. But I was its first student, so I'll tell you the story. I was already mad anyway. I mean, by any standards of what is normal in society, I was already mad. I was living wild. Um, I was very much alone in a process that I, I didn't even try to understand. I just went along for the ride because there was I just went along for the ride. <clears throat> yeah, it's my feeling exactly. A sheep in the background, that's nice. I'm a ram, they don't get slaughtered. Anyway, um, I was already mad. I didn't think about what was really happening to me because it was kind of frightening. I assumed that I had lost it. <laughs> It was my midlife, and uh, I was aware enough of the way in which things worked that I assumed that, yeah, I was losing it, whatever that meant. It didn't really mean anything to me because, in fact, the thing that surprised me about madness or craziness or whatever you want to call it is that it was entertaining, you know? It's the most interesting thing that had ever happened to me was to be crazy to get away from, yeah, all the accoutrement of Western civilization. To just, yeah, break down somehow, deconstruct. Anyway, it was January. January the 3rd, 1987. I was living in, uh, in this extraordinary old house, a ruina, a ruin, a real ruin. It had been built about 300 years ago and was built over a cistern, it was built over a well, it was built over the water source. The original front door, which when I was living there was no more than an entrance in what to appear to be a courtyard. It wasn't a courtyard, it was just the roof of the entrada of the house, the main living area of the house had collapsed long ago. They ran out of water. You run out of water, you don't stay. You can't grow anything, you can't survive. And slowly the ruina deteriorated and when I first saw it, I had rented the main house down below, Cascotchu. It was, uh, I think, 1984. And up above the house was the original main house, the, the Rowena. And the people that had owned the property, they had turned the only part of that ruin that still had some infrastructure, they turned it into a kind of guest room. Very simple, small enclosed space. And there was this big, huge wooden door in this door. It only took one of these giant iron keys, 
very old-fashioned key, 19th century key. Many years before that, before I even knew what a bisa was, I used to doodle all the time, and one of the things that I used to draw was this key over and over and over and over and over again. It was almost in every drawing that I had. And I would end up having that key in my hand and living in the room that that key opened the door to. Anyway, it was January 3rd and it was uh, dark. It wasn't late. But, you know, it gets dark early in January. It may have been around 5, 5.30. And I'd come back to the, the Rowena. I had uh, received a free meal, which was a treat for me. I didn't eat very often in those days. I was uh, mostly muscle and, and bone, nothing else. I can remember walking up from the road, from the main tarmac road, walking up the side of the hill. There was a little path that I had worn out with my footsteps leading up to the, the Ruina. And I remember Barley, Barley Baker, my dawn, kind of semi-wild creature. I guess he picked up my scent and he came running down the hill to meet me. And we walked together towards the, the ruin. That room the one room in the Ruina, it was very simple. It was about, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half meters by five meters, something like that. And there was a platform in it that I would sleep in. If you opened the door, you'd immediately see that platform. And uh, there was a desk, a kind of board that was over some, some bricks with a chair. And one wall was, um, all shelves and on the left hand side of that wall uh, were books all kinds of books and on the right hand side were jars of herbs the person that would stay in the ruina was somebody that when i was living in the main house i i let him stay in the ruina and it was his books his herbs years later he would let me stay in the ruina while he was away and so all of his things were in there there were some masks made by a French artist, Pascal, local artist here on the island. There were all kinds of strange things. He made um, hanging butterflies that people would buy in the flea markets. And there was a box of all of his stuff in there. And there was only one key. There was a kerosene lantern that hung over the platform but it was bone dry and the only place to get kerosene was on the other side of the island and I had neither money nor transportation so I lived a real airy in life I got up with the sun and when the sun went down I went to sleep and in fact that's what I was about to do I was headed back to the ruina to go to sleep yeah I was born for shock there was a light on underneath that door. And when the two of us arrived there and I see this light underneath the door, um, I get a funny feeling, I don't know, just that odd feeling. I could tell that it bothered the dog too. I had the only key one of these old-fashioned ones, and nobody else had it, and it was locked. And there was no other way in. And nobody would bother anyway, not anybody I knew. I was considered the local bad man. He didn't come near me. It was spooky. And darkness had settled in. It was really a black night, and it was full of stars. And I shouted at the door, it was my first uh, taste of irony. I shouted, who's there? Well, who was going to find out? There was no answer. A 
I put the key in the door. Funny about memory. I mean, what happened to me was not sequential. It was a kind of uh, action synthesis that I can deconstruct into components, but it's not the same as what it was to experience it. I pushed the key in the door, I turned the key and I pushed the door open inward and to the left and I pushed the door open. The kerosene lantern was lit and it was spinning. It's the first thing that I noticed. And at the same moment that I, I pushed open the door and saw the lantern spinning, my dog, Barley, crossed the threshold of the doorway. And as he crossed the threshold of the doorway, he fell like, well, like a creature that's been shotgunned close range. And at the same moment, I, I heard a voice. Um, it wasn't pleasant as a voice. I kind of imagined it as the voice of a cigar-smoking 155-year-old woman. It was quite a voice. And as I heard that voice, as the dog crashed, as the lantern spun, uh, uh, my body exploded with water. Um, it was gushing from my head. I mean, liquid water gushing from my head, from my arms and my legs and my groin. Everything was dripping water. There was a pool, literally a pool of my body water on the floor. The, the, the physical sensation of dehydration, super fast dehydration is pain. And in this emerging of the pain was this voice. And it said, are you ready to work? It was not a question. It really wasn't a question. I once thought it would be very funny to do this as a comedy routine, you know? Because it's funny in a way. Madness always is. The dog was lying on the ground in this pool of my water and the voice said to me, move it out of the way. So I moved it out of the way. I dragged the dog under my desk and put it there. It would be there for eight days. It would never move. It didn't seem to be breathing. and closed the door. And I closed the door. <laughs> Instructions. I I'm a manifester. If you tell me what to do, the chances are I will never pay attention to you again. And here I was in a situation where I was almost like an obedient dog, a frightened one. The pain was interesting. It was intense, but not unbearable. And my skin, you know, I couldn't touch it. I mean, I couldn't feel it. Sort of like what happens to you when your, your leg goes to sleep and, you know, you bang on it with your fist and there's nothing there. Uh, the voice told me
to do things. And the first thing that I had to do is that I had a, a, a butane stove, you know, with two little burners on it. And I was told to, to light the fire on the stove, so I lit the fire on the stove. Science fiction. The lights. I start the fire on the stove, and as I start the fire on the stove, the, the hair goes up on the back of my neck. And there's this um, neon blue light about that big, hovering in the middle of the room. Just hovering. The voice says, follow the light, which today is very funny. So I follow the light. And up until that point, I, throughout my deconstruction period, I had worn a, a mufti Arab headdress. And uh, there was a Buddha shroud that somebody had brought to me from Burma that was hanging on the wall. And the light went over to the Buddha shroud, so I put the Buddha shroud on. And then the light went over to the library. They pointed out three books. One was um, a King James Version of the New Testament. One of them was the Bhagavad Gita. And one of them was a Stanford biology textbook. Well, under instruction, I placed all of these things on, on my platform. There was... Um, a uh, uh, woven chessboard made out of leather and uh, there was um, a copper coil of wire that was used uh, by the man who lived there was used to make these butterflies and there were all these various things that I gathered and placed on the platform following this this line and then I was told to take herbs from the shelves. I had no idea what was in these jars. He was a herbalist and, and scoured all over the island for all kinds of different roots and herbs. And he made all kinds of strange concoctions. And I, I was not familiar with any of it. And the light would go to various jars, and I would take the contents, and I would put them on top of the stove, directly on top of the fire, and they would burn. Um, slowly the room began to fill with, with smoke. And then I put on the mask, oh, Pascal's mask, one of the two masks in the room, crack mask, crack right down the middle, right across the nose. A, com a kind of comedy dell'arte mask. So you have to see the scene and you have to appreciate it <laughs> for its madness, eh? Madness is such drama. So there I am sitting cross legged on my platform, wearing a Buddha shroud over my head and a cracked mask, and the smoke of burning herbs. And in front of me is this, this, chessboard with a coil in the middle of the coil are all of these books <laughs> and then the strangest thing of all the light goes to the very very top of the bookcase over on the right what appeared to be an orange crate so I have to climb up onto the desk even to reach it and I climb up on the desk and I pull down this box and inside this box are half-made butterflies, you know, butterfly wings, big butterfly wings like, like this, painted, hand-painted on canvas. The kind of things that, you know, you pull a cord and they flap up and down. So there was all these butterfly parts. And as I'm looking in the box, this, this hovering neon light comes swooping in and goes down to the box and sits on the bottom where there is a, 
a bedding of newspaper. So I reached down and pulled out the newspaper. It was um, a local publication from Mallorca, the Mallorca Daily Bulletin. And the front page was the story of the Mexican earthquake. It had taken place in December, just before my encounter. And on the front page is the story of Israel Diaz. It's one of those anagrams, Israel. The story of Israel Diaz trying to dig out his pregnant wife from underneath this rubble, and she stays there for eight days. And it's the story of how he gets her out and saves her and the baby. And I take this front page of this newspaper and I place it on top of this whole conglomeration of things on my bed. At the foot of my bed, I had been introduced to theosophical thought and I was investigating ray charts, very kind of obscure thing. And I had all of these examples of some of the people that I know. And the voice told me to go get one of these charts specifically of a man who was, well, an acquaintance of mine. And he said to me, put it on the fire. I put the, the graph, the chart on, on top of the smoldering herbs under the flames from the gas bomb and went back onto the platform and just sat there. And I could hear voices. It was very strange. I could particularly hear Spanish voices. Spanish-speaking voices. Um, couldn't quite make out what was being said. I was too astonished but by what I was looking at. I was looking at a piece of paper sitting on top of flames, and it wasn't burning. I mean, you know, it just wasn't burning. And while it wasn't burning, there were all of these sounds, voices, noise. At some point, I got very, very tired. I mean, yeah. And then I was given what was to be one of three mantras that I was given. I have no idea what it meant. Anyway, I repeated it a number of times, and the paper exploded into flame, disappeared. I fell back onto the platform. I was exhausted. Funny thing, too, I felt like I was levitating because I couldn't feel my body touching the platform at all, at all. Nothing. Nothing. And then the voice began to teach me. And it was wonderful, because when it spoke, I had no pain. There was just this kind of um, floating, floating in, in a information field. The story of the Big Bang rave cosmology style the mechanics, the crystals of consciousness, the nature of being. I'd never heard anything like it. I was very silent. I've never known myself to be so silent. It was just so, yeah, strange. It was raining. As a matter of fact, it was more than raining. It was pouring rain. 
I remember floating through the night, not awake, not asleep. Couldn't sleep with the pain, but I don't think I could have anyway. I had no hunger. I had no thirst. When the morning light came, the voice said to me, there's somebody at the door. Open the door. I opened the door and there's two people standing there. An Englishman and his girlfriend from India. It was his chart that burned on the fire. He's standing there. He's got this deeply confused look on his face because the two of them were on the way to France. They had already gone across on the ferry and suddenly felt compelled to return to see me not knowing why. As they're standing in the doorway, the voice tells me to let them in. So I let them in. It was very odd. She sat in the chair beside my dog, the one that didn't move, didn't breathe, never noticed. He sat at the other end of the platform from me. And then the voice said to me, you tell him precisely what I tell you. Okay. No arguments from me. Tell him about the crystals of consciousness. So I told him about the crystals of consciousness. And after I had told him about the crystals of consciousness, the voice said to me, now you tell him that you can give him the crystal that belongs to him. So that's what I told him. And the voice told me to tell him to come back that evening. Oh, that's what I told him. And the voice told me to throw them out, and that's what I did. When I closed the door, I went over to the desk. I was to get my first taste of, well, what would be the concrete magic of my experience. I got to draw a body graph. It was an incredible experience. Um, I couldn't feel, I, I did it with pencil, couldn't afford ink. Couldn't feel the pencil in, in, in my hand. And here is this strange thing, whatever it was, describing to me how to do this, how to draw it, where to put everything, the numbers, all of it. Incredible. That night, they came back just as they were told to do. And I invited them in and we closed the door. And she went over and sat down by the desk as before. And he and I would sit on the platform and I collected between us all of those things from the night before. And the leather chessboard and the coil and the books. I put on the shroud, I put on the cracked mask, and I gave him the other mask. And I put the herbs on the fire, and the room filled with smoke. And I sat opposite him. Now, madness is an interesting thing. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, after all. None. Like caught in this incredible, choiceless movie, strange movie. And he looked at me wondering what was going to happen, and I had no idea. I had told him he was going to get the crystal he deserved. 
And as I could feel his tension, all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, out of his right ear, I mean, out of his ear, came a light. Small, vibrating, three-dimensional white light. And it went straight up in the air. And it came directly over my head and went into my head. And the moment that it went into my head, he began to vomit. And I don't mean gag. I mean a river of it pouring out of him like, whoa, you don't see anything like that ever. There was an incredible rush of adrenaline. The voice told me to send them away. And I told them to leave. She got up and went out the door. He wouldn't move. He was just retching. I can remember grabbing the, the bed cover that he was on and yanking him from there and literally dragging him out and throwing him into the puddle outside the front door in the courtyard of the Ruina and slamming the door behind me. Many years ago, about three years after the event, I met this man again. He claimed that I had stolen his Ajna Center, been institutionalized for a number of years. I have a um, his friend, our mutual friend, who actually was the one who lived in the Rowena, he asked me one day what had happened. And so he was a poet. So a poet poem came out from me. It's called Chase the Laughter. They came on time, expecting, not knowing. Who could have possibly known what's new? Dark breakfast, India, cunt of Shiva, no on, no off, just so. And he too, like a martinet, chaplainess, strut, and Oxford stuff, not fools to be taken heavenly, no why. He liked to talk of being, he thought he could see, he knew, he knew nothing. They came on time. The trella la players, layers and layers and layers, into the house of the master, who can run faster, chase the laughter. The Department of Planning is having a get-together, they're very clever. And he was so busy pretending what he thought he couldn't understand that he crossed the line, he erased time, he was hopelessly mine. Who? Who could have possibly known chasing time down escalators for the benefit of fragile rocks? He cried, thief, thy if. Taking back was the key. Taking back was the key. Look out for the Holy Ghost superstar caviar on toast. He was unprepared. Consciousness was spared. He touched the warp at the edge of the center. The family cried, who can enter? Three, you'll agree, is all you ever get to see. Three, you'll agree, is all you ever get to see. Well, we'll see smoke and masks. Pascal's cracked armor, chessboard hexagrams of leather with biblical hands touching. It's all a matter of light into the house of the master who can run faster chase the laughter he was left in the dust mule what he bore he never knew and what he lost he could never see and what he has left is up to me see now where's the laughter it's from the here and after can't you agree that nothing we see is the same for you and me can't you agree that nothing we see is the same for you and me? Well, if you can't, here's a chant. Faster and faster, chase the laughter. Well, 
It was an odd beginning. See, when I entered into the Ruina, my name was Ra. And after the event, I would be Uruhu, which is a title. And Uru is this white light. <laughs> if I close my eyes like now, I see it. I have seen it all these years. It moves. We communicate. It's one of those magical things about the Ravi Ching. All those planets for the exalteds and detriments. I didn't pick them. Uru. Strange thing to live with. Twenty years, I live with this strange thing. I have no idea what it is. It's not like it's telling. See, madness is quite a thing. When they left, when they were gone, the process got serious. Yeah. Serious. I can remember sitting with my back to the wall, sitting on the platform, um, very confused by this thing in me, seeing it, understanding that, well, what to do? And in my almost panic, I suddenly feel a... Uh, hmm, so hard to describe. When something takes you and moves you, my head was snapped back. I mean, as far back as you can imagine, further than you can imagine, because it was so far back that there was practically no air going through. And in that moment, three lights, like, I don't know. What I do remember is feeling them, because they went directly into my body. Um, I've never been shot, but it, I imagine that's what it feels like. It certainly felt like that to me. It was very unpleasant. Um, I thought I was going to die. I didn't think I was going to survive. I could not breathe. I had this incredible pain in my chest from this penetration. And I could feel these things, whatever they were. I mean, I could feel them inside of me. I don't know what they did. I don't even know if they ever left. Hey? I have no idea. Not. All I know is that it was incredibly painful. When it was over, I floated in this kind of no sense of touching anything. And I closed my eyes and I watched this thing. And I realized that it was responsive. And we got to yes and no, up and down movements and circular movements. We would go much further than that, finding a way to communicate. I always thought it would go away, you know? I mean, I live the patina of a relatively normal life, family and stuff, you know? I do constructive good work in the world. I got this strange thing 
inside, never goes away, always has something to say, very strange. The third day, horror day, really horror day. I, I remember feeling it before I saw it. You know, these, these nights were very bizarre. There was no sleep, there was no real awakeness. When the light came, I would sort of yeah, get a grip on whatever was going on. And I felt so odd. And when I opened my eyes or looked or focused or however, you want to say that? I had no skin. No, it's covered in scales. I had no genitals. I mean, if you want to talk about panic and shock, there's a panic shock moment for you, you know? One can only wonder if it'll ever go away. It was horrifying, like some kind of uh, reptilian science fiction creature. It was horrifying. Yeah. Madness. Quite a movie. It would go took hours, and suddenly it was gone. That night, the voice took me outside into the courtyard. There was this um, cracked glass, old piece of mirror. And I stood in front of that thing, and I was given a kind of uh, yeah, magical mystery tour of my past lives, all kinds of images, all kinds of things. It was boring, actually, given the intensity of everything else. It, I never really have had much of a sense of, or interest in past lives. I was, uh, I never enjoyed it when the voice told me about me. It was much more entertaining to simply <laughs> survive whatever it was and not have to deal with the madness of being told that you were this or that or the other thing, whatever it was. The voice never told me what to do in the sense of what my experience was for. Yeah, it wasn't like, go out there and do something with it. I guess that's an obvious. One experience for me was really amazing, very confusing. I guess it's like people who have multiple personalities. And I had this experience of being taught about the body graph and all of the centers suddenly had voices. And then they were all talking to me from inside my body, talking to me from my own centers. Very strange, rather frightening, actually, all these voices inside, male, female, young, old, arguing, talking over each other. People have wondered over the years how I received the information, you know, because there's so much information in human design. was planted in me. I guess that's the only way I can describe it. Yeah, all the surface things, my neocortex was given certain information that it could handle. The body graph, the infrastructure, the, the way in which things work, the basic story of the cosmology. But this incredible capacity to be able to filter anything through its matrix. You know, I was engineered. I mean, I'm somebody who was engineered. 
I, I guess this is the way that it works. It certainly is the way that it has worked for me. I never got to say anything. Two thoughts of mine were responded to. They, they were barely thoughts. One was my concern for my dog, and it was then that the voice told me about the design of forms, rather an incredible thing. The other was my amazement at the information. I remember wanting to know where it was coming from, and the voice said, from the book of letters. Many years afterward, maybe a decade afterward, on tour in the United States, I had a woman come up to me, tell me about a friend of hers, brother or something, I don't remember exactly. Somebody who had gone mad in January of 1987. And had gone mad in January 1987 and remained institutionalized. He was, uh, the last thing that he did was, uh, write in a journal of his from the book of letters. It was the last thing he wrote. You know, it's one of my things about the information of human design is that I was closest to the source. That Rowena sat over an empty, empty cistern, an empty cavern. It was into that cavern that the design crystal bundle came. Not what other messengers have connected to. Not personality crystal bundles that all have perspectives so that we all end up with messages that get translated into different cultural preferences. No, this came from the design crystal bundle. It came from the totality of the form principle. I was sitting on top of it, taking it in through the neutrino stream, through the aura contact. And it went out all over. It laid the seed of the knowledge. I was told a lot of things. Wonderful things, mysterious things. Shown things, heard things. Watched them. When I think back now, it's a long time ago. I realize how incredible it was and what a privilege it was to have such a strange experience. But then, I mean, I got tired of the pain. The end was beautiful, as end should be. It was uh, the eighth day, and the voice told me to, to go up onto the mountain above the Ruina. A beautiful place, very isolated, beautiful view. And I went up there and I sat down. I guess it was around midday. The voice told me that it was leaving. And then it said the strangest thing to me. It said, stare into the sun. And you know, as a joke, considering all the madness I had been through, I don't know why I was so upset with the idea that I was going to stare into the sun, but I was. My assumption was you go blind doing that. The voice gave me a, a mantra, told me that the sun was my dog. Sawelu, my dog. So I sat there and I opened up my eyes to the sun. And as I did that, the voice, well, it was gone. Incredible experience to stare into the sun, full stare. Have the light burn through the eyes down into the esophagus. To see the blue angel dancing and the flames, the blue flames burning into your body. Yeah. The dogs know.
maybe hours, I was there. At some point, I stopped and began to walk down the, the hill. And as I walked down the hill, racing up to greet me was Barley. Eight days, no movement, no breath, no food, no liquid, no nothing. There he was, bouncing along, wagging his tail, happy as hell. And then it was over. I was not relieved. I thought it would have been. You only have that kind of magic if you're lucky. Once in a hundred lifetimes. To step out, go beyond the veil. Great nihilist like me meeting the forces. One. And how depressing it was to come back into the world of the not-self. And to be a freak in that world. To have nothing. To have all this knowledge. And to have nothing. Yeah. So it goes. What to do. It's the only time in my life I ever knew depression. I've never known depression. Um, it is very, very difficult. I mean, it's obvious from the telling of this story that it's not the kind of story that you want to tell too many people, funny enough. You know, it's, it's an odd story. It's rather strange. Given the way our culture operates, it's even frightening to some people because they tend to, well, they tend to project on it something that it is not. Uh, to go through such an experience, to be in such a space, and then to leave it, um, it's painful. This is the mundane plane. It's you crawl back into your body and you understand that it has weight and form and it's got to eat and you have to feed yourself. And the world is full of fools. and You're not exactly going to run around telling people that a voice told you how everything works. And uh, I guess I was feeling sorry for myself. Not something I had ever known before. I mean... Uh, I was an incredible freak, living a freak's life. I had, uh, I had no money, I had no home, I had, you know. Um, what had happened to me was obviously mad, it was crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly felt like the whole thing was uh, 
yeah, in that moment of kind of tragedy, I had had my moment of exhilaration and wonder, and it was over, and it was never going to happen again, and that was the end of it. Um, I basically tried to get rid of it. I mean, uh, I basically tried to get rid of it, and I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't get rid of it in terms of what was happening inside of my body, and I couldn't get rid of it on the outside. I tried, I tried, I burnt everything. I, it wouldn't go away from me. And um, for about nine months after the encounter came to an end, um, Yeah, I just floated in a sedated world, um, trying not to be Ra Uruhu. Wasn't meant to be. Well, it seems clear to me, based on you know, who I was before and who I was after, and that there are certain things that are just different. There are physical differences. I mean, my own mother didn't recognize me, didn't even recognize my eyes. Um, the texture of my skin changed, my voice changed. Um, the nature of my laugh was different. Uh, many physical changes that actually took place in my body that were easily recognizable by people who knew me before and after. So there were physical things that were different. I went through what was an intensely physical process. I, I think that the, the evidence of it is in the body of my work. I've been asked the question over and over and over again. I've been teaching, uh, yeah, nearly nearly 18 years now. Where does it all come from? Uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of material of me teaching. Um, I have never had any notes. I have never prepared. I honestly have no idea where it comes from. It's simply there. Whenever I look at anything that has to do with the Maya, it is instantaneously there. The question has an answer. Um, and it doesn't matter what area that I explore in terms of my work in laying out all of this knowledge. Um, the the logical, verifiable perfection of the knowledge just simply emerges. Um, I I deal with that within myself with great humility. I I it's a miracle to me. Um, so. Given the kinds of things that I went through during the event where things uh, entered into my body and there were uh, metamorphic changes in, in, in my form, it seems clear to me that something was done, whatever it was, I don't know. Um, I was always smart, but I, I was never a genius. And uh, these 18 years are nothing but genius. And that's not me. So that's Ra Uruhu. Uh, and Ra Uruhu is a complexity of things. You know, according to, to my interpretation of, of what happened to me, I, I, I have three, three crystals in here somehow. Um, and because I communicate with one of them, um, there is a sort of oddity. But then again, you know, I'm a master of the Maya. I sit back in my consciousness and I just experience the process. And I don't really 
it's not as if I were uh, schizophrenic or had multiple personalities and were having conversations back and forth in this kind of fashion. Uh, it's not like that at all. It's just simply clear to me that whoever this being is that I'm living now um, is a construct. It's just a construct. And so I accept it as a construct. Yeah, obviously it's something that uh, I've thought a lot about over the years. Obviously some kind of formula. I think the thing that was most interesting was the biology textbook. I think it's very hard to understand from the telling of that story how uh, my relationship with my visitors and that what appears to be some kind of black magic event, how all of that is connected. Um, there was this Stanford biology textbook. I have no idea why it was there. And um, when I when I laid that down in in that grouping with the the coil and the the New Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, um, the voice actually gave me a page to open up to, and um, that was spooky in a sense. It was as if it knew the book, if you know what I mean. A very strange experience. And uh, in opening up the book, it was um, it was titled Quadro Parentalism, and uh, it was a section in the reproductive section, and it was about the potential of um, one child having four parents, um, which has its own mythological roots, the Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and so forth. Um, from what I understand about the the experience is that that um, that child that was in the womb of the wife of Israel Diaz in the earthquake in in Mexico that that child was carrying um, a crystal um, not a crystal that was part of its you know basic uh, dualistic system but it was um, how shall we say that? It was used as a place to gestate it or to to give it its presence on this plane. And, and my visitors in the event, um, you know, I was told he was a mule. That is, uh, that whole what appeared to be magical event was about taking that crystal out of that infant after its eight days underground in that you know, collapsed building and moving it into this being who received it when he was in France and uh, was compelled to come back and, uh, yeah, to, uh, yeah, to fulfill whatever that mythology is with me. And uh, the event that took place between him and I, uh, this was just the way in which the whole system, you know, took out of him what belonged to me and gave it to me. Um, it's an odd enough story as it is without the accoutrement. However, it, it, it you know, there's something called the wa, and um, it's a transpersonal um, aura. And the wa is the foundation for planetary programming. And uh, there are 16 specific fields in the wall. Um, each of these wheels, fields are connected to what I was told is something called an engram, which is a, a crystal. There are 16 of them. They are always incarnated on this planet. And uh, according to what I was told, that crystal that came to me in that event uh, is an engram. I, I honestly don't know what it does. My assumption is that it's as much a, a reporter as it is an informer, uh, in the sense that uh, it's connected to a much larger programming agency. So, but nonetheless, that's, yeah, it's my footnote on that piece of bizarre. You know, helplessness is an odd thing. There's a great vanity in human beings that they 
they think there are people that can control such kinds of events. Um, I was as helpless as he was. We were just caught up in a drama. Um, in the end, uh, I mean, he was a rather unstable being to begin with. It wasn't like he was, uh, he wasn't. Um, and as far as I know, today he's fine. He lives in Amsterdam. But at that time, he was, um, he thought something had happened to him. He did not see what happened, by the way. He just felt something, and obviously it had quite an impact on him. Um, he would actually come back. Um, yeah, he wanted to kill me, so he said. He, he struck me violently in the head, I remember that. Um, and then he left. Uh, yeah, helplessness, helplessness. Everyone was helpless in that movie. I guess the strangest one was the one related to the sun because uh, I was actually afraid. I thought I was going to burn out my eyes. Um, and so I was given this mantra. And... Um, It seemed to work. I mean, uh, I stared into the sun several hours every day for about four years. Um, I can still see, so I suppose there was something to it. No, my only concern about publicly sharing my own process is that it makes me interesting other than simply being the, the person who started the knowledge, if you know what I mean. My emphasis has always been on the knowledge. It's the thing that, you know, stands the test of time. It's the thing that can stand the scrutiny of scientists and uh, it can be looked at from every perspective, and it can be seen that it's it's valuable for human beings. And human design is is a matrix that's there for everyone. That is, it doesn't matter what your religion is or your culture is or whatever. It's about understanding what it is to be a human being, and it's a value to all. Um, the cult of personality is a dangerous thing. Um, there are a lot of people that will take this story and uh, turn it into religious spirituality, boom, boom, whatever, you know, that's what people do. Um, there will be people that will project on it that it's the devil's work and it's all dark and it's terrible and it's this and that and blah, blah, blah. There will people just think it's a story, I don't know. Um, it's a strange thing for me to share it anyway. Um, it's just that, you know, had human design not established it, itself in the world, there would be no need for me to tell this story. <laughs> I cannot ignore where this came from, no matter how bizarre the circumstances, no matter how strange it may be for others. It is, in fact, the way in which the information came into the world. And it's the most important information that's in the world now. So, yeah, whatever the bizarre of it is, I think it's a story that needs to be told. How people will react. I'm a five, you know. They react in all kinds of ways. Some people will love it and some people will hate it because that's the nature of being, what to do. I'll live with it. Whatever it is. <laughs> That's very clever. Um, you know, chess is quite a game. It's always an advantage to play white, but it's much more interesting to play black and win. I was shown all my lives in this round. It's about 
over the last 18,000 years. There must have been a couple of hundred of them. There were these smoky white, um, hazy kinds of, of faces, um, one after the other. And uh, it wasn't like I was given um, stories. I do remember every once in a while getting a funny feeling as I looked at a face. Um, but it went on too long. And that was the boring part. It just went on and on and on and on and on. It was frightening how, 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 how many of them there were. And yeah, um, I was glad when it was over. Ha! <laughs> it's from the Book of Letters, which is actually the name rather than the Book of Letters. I mean, it's, the Book of Letters obviously must be older and I have no idea. Um, I actually, I assume it is the, it, it is the quantum of form consciousness. That is, uh, within the earth we have, uh, we have a single design crystal bundle. Um, considering that every living thing is endowed with a design crystal, um, just in terms of trying to count all the cells on earth, one begins to imagine the, in the depth of that consciousness field. Um, my assumption is the book of letters is the consciousness field itself. I mean, we have traditions of that. That is, uh, you know, the crystal bundle came into the cisterna under the ruina. So I was close to it. Close to the neutrino feed, as close as you can get, I guess, in that situation. And uh, it seems to me that that is an old tradition. It's been called Shambhala. Um, it's been called many things. And uh, yeah, it's just the consciousness field. And I, I got from the Book of Letters. I got bits and pieces from it. Um, I don't think that... I, I know. It's not even a matter of thinking. I know that my brain in no way could handle the information that it could have been given. So I think I got the children's version, you know, I got, I got the cartoon version, you know, just to make it simple for the kid, you know. It's a great joke. Israel. Is it, has it a meaning? Yeah, El is basically the name for the Messiah. So it's just kind of cute. And I have exactly the same birthday as Israel. We were born at the same time. And according to, <coughs> according to Jewish tradition, um, it's why the, the, the Orthodox in Israel do not recognize the state. Because according to their tradition, you, the state of Israel cannot exist until the Messiah is born. So it's a nice joke. And I do like jokes. Surprising you haven't asked me the obvious. Why haven't you asked me the obvious? <laughs> Am I following the light? No. No, I don't follow. I don't follow it at all. As a matter of fact, that is not the nature of the relationship whatsoever. Uh, it never tells me to do anything. It has nothing to do with that. It has no capacity to do so. I mean, uh, even the communication is deeply limited. It, 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 it's, a, it's a number formula. As a matter of fact, it's based on the I Ching. So there's a way of, of translating movement into numbers and numbers into keynotes so that there is a way of communicating. But there's no way this thing has ever told me anything other than responding to something that I'm curious about. Um, I ignore it most of the time. I ignore it most of the time because it... it <laughs> I think, you know, you know what we do in, in, in nature when we're concerned about the survival of a species? Let's say it's brown bears. We go into the forest and we catch one, you know, and we put it to sleep and we tag it, you know, we tag it with a GPS, you know, we just tag the sucker. We put in a microchip so we can check its vitals and all of that stuff. And then we go back to the studio and we sit there and we watch the bear. 
Well, I'm that bear. You know, I, uh, this thing, whatever it is, because it, it, it has very little to do with my life other than the fact that it's an oddity that I live with. It seems that I've been tagged, you know? I'm just a bear. And uh, though it responds to my questions because of the nature of our communication, it, it's not an easy thing to have even the rudiments of a conversation. As a matter of fact, it's much more interesting on a yes and no basis because it's just curious, God bless you. It's much more interesting on a yes and no basis. But even that, uh, I realize something about it. Uru, because that's what it is, um, is limited in, in what it can possibly know, like everything else. And uh, I, I think it's very communication with me is outside of what is its basic parameters. So it's a very odd thing. Um, there are moments that I, I realize that uh, there is, a, you know, it's my continuity with, with the event. It's what stayed with me consistently through all of these years. It's been there from the moment of that experience. It's never gone away. It, I assume it will be with me until the day I leave this plane. So in that sense, it reaffirms in, in my own process day by day that either I'm the strangest man on the planet right now or I'm really whacking crazy, you know? I mean, just one or the other, right? And, uh, yeah, that, you know, as a dualist, that's fine with me. You know, I know that the truth is somewhere beyond either, either end of those polarities. Whatever it is and whatever it means, the light just reminds me that I'm different. <laughs> what to do? You know, I just watch the movie. It's entertaining after all. It's something different. Well, who's a title? It's a title. I'm a door closer. You know? I mean, uh, you know, if you go to one of the hip clubs here in Ibiza, there's a bouncer at the door. And um, I'm the complete opposite of that. I'm the one who closes the door so that everything can come to an end. And that's my job. I, otherwise, this knowledge could not exist. I mean, this is not beginning knowledge. This is end knowledge. This is what you get at the end of a cycle. It's not what you get at the beginning. And uh, end knowledge means that there are opportunities. <coughs> that there are opportunities for transcendence. That there are opportunities now for human beings to grasp the way that things work. And to discover awareness to be able to see the beauty of what it is to be here on this plane and to be out of the suffering of what it is to be caught in the Maya. And it's what the knowledge is for. And it gives humanity 1,300 years. Well, it gives them a chance. It gives them a chance to, uh, well, to discover the laughter because that is what it's all about. I was sitting in a courtyard of a place called Can Maestra, the house of the master. All these old houses have names. And I was sitting in this courtyard and uh, the English poet, butterfly maker, who's Ruina, I first put him in there and then he put me in there. And he was a friend of this man that was there in the event with me and he, he had come to me and he had asked me about what had happened and I, I, I was unable to tell him. I, I just could not tell him. Um, and he went away. And when he went away, as I was sitting in the courtyard, this thing came through my head. I mean, I didn't sit down and write it. Right? It just came and stayed, and it's never gone away. And uh, there was a... Um, in those days in the village, there was a, 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 a bunch of people who did uh, poetry readings. And there was a poetry reading one evening, and so I showed up, and uh, I did chase the laughter and to try to explain to him what had happened. You know, they came on time not knowing, you know. Uh, me neither. Um, but in terms of deconstructing the poetry, 
It's all about chasing the laughter. There's, it's a wonderful joke in the end. I mean, I think the thing that I enjoy the most about yeah, being a messenger of the form principle is that it's earthy, you know? It, uh, it carries uh, great humor with it. And everything about life is about reaching a point in which you can be surrendered to entertainment. Life is entertaining. And the laughter is good for us. Yeah. By the way, Chase the Laughter and Sarah sang a lullaby came one day after each other mm -hmm. and no more ever came. Just those two. Right? Sarah sang a lullaby. Sigh and sign altered by the line. We sail on neutrino seas, light so heavy it remembers tomorrow. Dream tigers, illusion geigers, for someone else's night we drift neutrino blind into dazzling remembrance. Homer held a violet to the sun. It could not alter the nature of being so, 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 tabulations, tribulations. We sing neutrino songs, cosmic all alongs, mice. My small feet beneath the trunk, how the elephant smells, Hermes shells, Desdemona's hell. Do you remember? Do you remember? It could not alter the nature of being. Alter upon which altar? Try to remember what? Your last face. What is grace? Submarine strategies for thriving swells. It's on the tip of every wave. Cargo through darkness, long lines of light, bumper to bumper to Cassiopeia's chassis. Do you recall? Slowly you and I try. Slowly you and I try. Neutrino views, neutrino news. What's neutrino, you who? There's a neutrino in town hanging around. Look out for your little sisters. He'll never yang up his guns. Light ain't heavy. Has it ever occurred to you that there's nothing new? Well, it's not true. Geometry's a staircase, Aryan race, stoic face, no trace. In the end, all lines embrace. Who? Who wrote the who? Who knew who wrote the who? Who you see? One and two are three. Why be just to see? So let's agree that the beginning before the start, had a nature. Bye, Rob. He came on the tide, came across on the other side. He says it comes for you. You have to wait and see if it's true. Came on the tide.